ahead and, and get our first speaker going. Um, today, uh, our first speaker is going to be on high tunnel cucumber production tips. And we have uh, Weijing uh, Gwen, Laura Ingwall, and Dan Eagle speaking for our first session. So I will turn it over to you folks. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I'll get my screen shared. Okay, everyone see my screen? Okay, if I didn't hear anything, I mean, things are going well, I assume. It looks good. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, my name is Wenjing Guan. I'm a horticulture specialist um, located at Southwest Purdue Agriculture Center. Uh, myself, um, Laura Ingwell, Dan Eagle, we will um, do this presentation to discuss the high tunnel cucumber production. Um, first, I want to introduce you a new um, published high tunnel cucumber production guide um, and by myself, Laura, and Dan. Um, and in this presentation, actually, I will highlight a few key points um, in this um, presentation. Uh, in, in this um, production guide. And if you are looking for more detailed information, uh, we have the QR code, you can scan it, that leads you to our website. You could download this um, production guide for free. Okay, um, some general production considerations for cucumber production in high tunnels. Cucumber is a warm season crop. Um, transplants should be used in the tunnel. It can be planted in spring or fall. A good thing about cucumber is that the time from transplanting to the time the fruit is ready to harvest can be as short as within a month under optimal condition. And cucumber plants are very sensitive to low temperatures. Uh, what this means is the crop season will for sure end at the first frost in the fall. Even before that, if actively grown plants rain to temperatures below 15 Fahrenheit, you may see some damage. And in the spring, newly planted cucumbers are often suffer from low temperature stress. Uh, we will talk more about that later. Um, and cucumber can tolerate higher temperatures than tomato do. Um, but still, if temperatures are above 19.5 Fahrenheit for extended period, um, plant growth is suppressed and the harvest season will be shortened. Now for cultivar selection, the most important point is to make sure to pick a personal crop cultivar, which means the plant do not need pollination. So high tunnel growers don't need to worry about bring beehives to the tunnel. There are a few major type of cucumbers that are suitable for growing in high tunnels. Decision on cultivar selection would depend on production system, market preference, and available labor. I will explain those major type of cucumbers um, um, separately. And I also have some of the example cultivars for each of these types. First, let's start with meaning beta alpha cucumber. Uh, those are the cucumbers you likely see them in grocery store with four or five fruit packed together in plastic bag or styrofoam trees. The size range from four to eight inches per fruit. Um, Many cucumbers are very productive this type, especially under optimal growing condition with intensive fertility management. The plants develop multiple fruit at each node. Sometimes you can get three or even five for some million type of cucumbers. So it's very productive under intensive fertility. Now the second type I'm going to introduce is the Dutch greenhouse cucumber. This is the types you would see with your wrapped in grocery stores about a foot long. And price is high. Each fruit weighs about a pound. Dutch greenhouse cucumber are bred exclusively for greenhouse production. It has a potential for high tunnel production, but a few things growers need to be aware of. First, 
this type of cucumber can very easily fall misshapen or curved fruit. The misshapen fruit may still be marketable at farmer's market, but it reduces market value. The reason cause misshapen fruit can be because the fruit growth is physically interrupted. Like in this case, the cucumber plants are growing in soil. Fruit at the first few nodes touch ground and form misshaped fruit. Another reason for the misshapen fruit is the fact that the female flower are bee pollinated. Although all the cucumber types we talked here are parsonocarpic, which means they don't need pollination. We do notice Dutch greenhouse cucumber, those non-type cucumber, is the type more likely to form misshapen fruit when it was accidentally being pollinated. Last but not least, seed price for Dutch greenhouse cucumber can be as high as a dollar per seed. So if you can manage your production system and be able to have its cucumbers from the same planting for three months and above, the high seed cost problem is not a big concern. However, if the harvest season is really short, the dense greenhouse type cucumber probably is not the best choice. Now the third type is American slicer cucumber. Those cucumbers have darker and thicker skins very similar to field grown cucumbers, except they do not have the yellow white belly and you would see in the field grown slicer cucumbers. Because it is very similar to field grown slicer cucumber, depend on your customers. This type of cucumber probably is the easiest one to sell, but may not sell at high price. The skin is thicker than mini and dense greenhouse cucumbers. The last type I want to discuss is the Japanese cucumber, sometimes called Asian cucumber. Similar to Dutch greenhouse cucumber, this type also have the long slender fruit, thin skin, easy to be distinguished from field grown cucumbers, has potential to be sold at a higher price. Good thing about Japanese cucumbers is that the seed price is relatively cheap and they are less likely to form misshapen fruit compared to Dutch greenhouse cucumber. A unique thing about Japanese cucumber is that the plants have both male and female flowers. Uh, the cucumber types we discussed the, um, before only have female flowers, but Japanese cucumber have both male and female flowers. And the first of few nodes form exclusively male flower. Um, those plants will require more pruning and trellising if they are grown in a one liter system. Okay, I want to share this, our uh, Caldiva evaluation results with you. In 2018, we evaluated 16 high tunnel cucumber cultivars of the different types at three locations. Um, at all these three locations, cucumber are grown with a one liter system with bottom leaves pruned, uh, as you can see in this picture. Um, at the three sites, we use different fertility management system. At site one and site two, uh, cucumbers are grown on the ground. At site one, an intensive fertility system was used. Uh, we had three fertigation events per day throughout the season and targeted about one pounds uh, per acre nitrogen per day. At site two, all fertilizers were applied pre-plant and the plants was run into nutrient deficiency towards the end of the season. And harvest season was shorter compared to the first site and the third site. At site three, cucumbers are grown in a hydroponic system in per night. And you can imagine very intensive fertility management. And this high tunnel structure itself is more similar to a greenhouse. It has cooling system in the summer and installed with insect netting on the sides. An interesting thing we saw in this um, cultivar evaluation at the three site is that there was not a huge difference among cultivars of the same type of cucumbers, but there was large difference on performance of the different types of cucumbers under different production systems. 
So for example, uh, in general, uh, the beta alpha meaning cucumber in the first graph, it did not do well, like in different cultivars within this type, it did not do well in at site two um, here, um, but they did very well at site one, at site three. Those bars indicate the yield per plant. Now let's see the down greenhouse cucumber, the lung cucumber. It did not do well as site two, also did not do that well as site one, but their performance is very good at site three, the hydroponic system. So the trend of performance, but the trend of performance of Japanese cucumber and the American slicer cucumber were similar. Um, among the three side, uh, we think is very interesting. So what this tell us is um, what is your production system would be important um, in your consideration of picking which cultivars you want to grow. Um, now about pruning and trellising systems. The most commonly used system for cucumber production in high tunnel are the netting system and the one liter system, the netting and the one liter. Um, both systems have pros and cons. The biggest advantage of netting system is to save labor in pruning and trellising. While the major drawback of this system is that it cannot support extended harvest. And pest management is also more difficult in the netting system. However, depending on the type of cucumbers you grow, for a short time harvest, like a month harvest, a um, netting system might achieve a higher yield compared to the one liter system. But if your goal is to harvest cucumbers for five, four, five, even six months, the one liter system would be the one you want to choose. Okay, I will pass this to Laura and she will talk about the pest management. Laura, are you here? Okay, sorry, I was waiting for someone to unmute me. Thank you, whoever mm -hmm. did that. Okay, so um, yeah, like Wen Jing has been talking about cucumbers, I've been working on the insect and pest management side of this crop in high tunnel systems and by far cucumber beetles and the bacterial wilt that they transmit is um, one of the most limiting, um, I think it ties with mites. Um, so um, a little bit about the biology of cucumber beetles. They are native to the region and they overwinter as adults. And so there are really two peaks in adult presence on the crop that you need to combat. There's this early peak in April, uh, depending really on how warm the spring is, where these adults are moving out of their overwintering habitat, um, which is just weedy vegetation, and they're flying, and they're looking for cucurbit hosts. And depending on what it looks like in your area, if you have the only cucumbers or cucurbit in general, they will find it. Um, they only feed on cucurbits. And so that is usually a time when we have fairly young plants in the ground. Um, sometimes outdoor production can miss it, but in the high tunnels, um, you can have quite large plants at that point. And so the risk there is that the beetles will feed directly on the plants and transmit bacterial wilt. Um, this is a pathogen that clogs up the xylem and kills the plant. So you cannot harvest from that plant and you lose all of that product. Those adults then, um, feed on the plant, lay eggs at the base, and then usually in mid-August, you'll get the this new generation exploding, coming out of the soil, and again feeding on the plant. At that time, it's usually more of a risk directly to the fruit because you'll be in full swing of harvest, both in high tunnels and in the field, and so you'll get damage like this on the middle um, picture where they're eating directly on those fruits. And so, um, what I have learned over the past few years is really the best way 
to avoid using um, insecticides and pretty, pretty toxic insecticides in a high tunnel system is to try to exclude them with mesh screening. So in this guide that we produced, um, I, there's a lot of information about the particular size of the mesh. You wanna be very selective in what size mesh you're using when you install it on these um, structures so that you don't minimize airflow too much to um, lead to fruit abortion and bud abortion of flowers. Um, and you don't want it to get too large that the insects can get in. So there's um, very detailed information and even a YouTube video about just one way in which you can install that. And then one Jing, you wanna switch? Yep. And so this is the second pest that is, well, I guess I have aphids and mites on here, but mites really are another one that can sort of creep up on you. And so mites and aphids both really thrive in hot, conditions and with um, the exclusion of rainfall. Their number one mortality in the field is just being dislodged from the plant due to rain. So when you put them in this high tunnel situation, they are protected and they just thrive. And so um, mites usually show up around July, I think is a pretty common date that we see them in high numbers. Although if you grow over winter in your tunnels and you transition, they are likely there and on the weeds. So right now, Wenjing and I both have strawberries in our high tunnels and the spider mites are overwintering and feeding on those strawberries. Um, so they can come into the crop earlier. So the key for mites really is to watch for those early signs. If you get to the point where the plant is completely covered in webbing like this, um, there's really no chance to rescue it. Um, so early intervention, and um, I've seen good control. If you get in early and you use a really good product, you can knock them back. But again, this relies on a synthetic insecticide. Um, aphids can also be a problem if they get in and you don't have the natural enemies. And I highly recommend using bee leaf. It's specific for piercing sucking insects and does a really great job. And then lastly, before we move on to diseases, our squash bugs. Um, I don't think that they're a huge problem, um, but I did want to mention them. Occasionally they make their way in there, but I think they usually prefer if you have um, cucurbit crops out in the fields. And the key with squash bugs is that you watch for the egg masses and you treat when you see those eggs start to hatch and you have those little nymphs on the plant. Um, if you try to spray those adults, it's just a waste of chemistry and it's not gonna get them. So once you see adults in there, look for eggs and, and monitor for that egg hatch and that's when you can treat. And they can cause damage on the fruit as well. Okay, uh, thanks Laura. Um, yeah, we will move to disease management and Dr. Dale will talk about disease. Hi, thank you. Um, I'll uh, go into the, some of the diseases, some, some of the more common diseases that, that you might have. Uh, the first one, probably the more, most likely one you, you, you would have was powdery mildew. The symptoms are fairly distinctive as seen here, kind of a powdery appearance on, the, on both sides of leaves. It's an obligate pathogen, which means it does not survive in residue. It has to blow in from another field. Um, uh, so, it, so therefore, uh, tillage and crop rotation aren't really very good with this. It prefers really uh, relatively dry conditions. It's, it's, it's windborne. Um, there is host resistance available, and in the, the guide, the extension publication, we talked about some of the varieties we looked at. Um, and then uh, systemic fungicides are recommended. And again, in the guide, uh, there is a table full of fungicides and, and, and different characteristics of those fungicides that you might use. Go ahead, Wenjing. So uh, downy mildew is probably less common, less likely to happen, and if it happens, uh, it, it doesn't overwinter in Indiana. It's again an obligate pathogen. It's going to happen probably uh, towards the end of the year, uh, August and in, in, in September, because it doesn't overwinter in Indiana. It has to blow in. Um, but you see the angular spots on the leaf here. Um, and then, Wenjing, if you can go to the next slide, the underneath characteristic is the underneath you'll see these kind of fu the fuzzy growth on the leaf bottom and that, that'll uh, tell you for sure that that's uh, downy mildew. 
So it occurs late in the year. It, it, it likes kind of cool conditions, cool wet conditions. Two hours of leaf wetness are enough, really. There's there's host resistance to some of the seed catalogs, but it's kind of iffy because the 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 fungus, the fungus-like organism that causes it, can change pretty rapidly. And there's specialty systemic fungicides available, but um, uh, you'll have to have to watch and make sure which ones are labeled for for greenhouse use and that kind of thing. And and I, unfortunately, the ones that are best for for downy mildew are not good for powdery mildew. Go ahead, Winjing. And then uh, white mold is one that we've seen in, in, in greenhouse conditions. Uh, and you see the irregular fruiting bodies shown here and a little bit of the white mold. And what happens is you get this kind of woody looking appearance on the stem. And then of course the rest of the vine dies back. Um, it's got a large host range, um, including tomato is very common on tomatoes and more common on tomatoes and on cucumbers in, in high tunnels or greenhouses than it is out in the field. But these little uh, dark bodies that you see in the stem, they survive in the soil uh, and then they'll, they'll grow up into very, very small mushrooms and the spores will blow 300 feet. So if you take those, those vines and, and place them outside your greenhouse, you'll get those mushrooms and, and the spores will blow in uh, next spring. So you'll want to reduce leaf wetness if you can. And there are some biological control products that I talk about uh, in the extension bulletin. Go ahead, Wenjing. And then I think this is the last disease. This is not, this is one that, that we've seen. It, it's a new report here in Indiana. Um, so we're, we're kind of putting this out there. I'll look for it. This disease uh, occurs also on uh, other crops around the region, for example, soybeans. So we know the organisms out there and it loves the kind of the hot, uh, dry soils in, in high tunnels or greenhouses. So it causes kind of a gray lesion on the stem. And the reason it's gray is because there's very small fruiting bodies on the, on the stem there. And you can tell because the stem is, is a big lesion there, uh, it, it'll cause the rest of the, the vine to wilt. And that's probably the first thing that you'll uh, notice again, there's a, a large host range, survives very well in the soil, prefers high soil temperatures. Uh, there's, there's some uh, some literature says if you deep plow the, re uh, the residue, that'll help, but, uh, but, but that's not always true. You would probably want to take this uh, vine and take it out of the greenhouse and, and get it well away from the greenhouse, the high tunnel. Uh, if you have continued problems with this production in pots, might be one alternative to get away from, from charcoal rot. And I think I have one last uh, slide. Okay, so I would just want to talk about some disease management things. On the, the photo on the left here shows uh, one of Winjing's uh, experiments and you see it's on black plastic and the cucumbers are growing out of the black plastic. And then you have, we have white landscape cloth in between. You don't have to have white landscape cloth, but I think as we talked about taking affected vines out of the greenhouse, if you have landscape cloth in between, uh, you, you can take these vines and, and get the sweep up any remaining debris, uh, which otherwise would enter into the soil and cause problems the next year. And in the right photo, you see our greenhouses here where uh, there's a, a good area of gravel beyond the greenhouse, which we keep free of weeds. And that kind of thing uh, will, will make it uh, uh, less likely that pathogens and, and insects will kind of take root right around the greenhouse. And uh, that, that's all I had, Wenjing. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Um, lastly, I will very briefly mention some physiological disorders. In this picture on the left, you see those um, misshaped fruit. Um, that is caused by uneven supply of water. Um, I want to growers to understand that cucumber have a very high demanding of water, especially in the middle of the summer. Um, so supply them enough water and the even in supplying the water is pretty important. And this picture here that is in a high tunnel have very high EC content. Uh, so cucumber is quite sensitive to soil fertility issues, probably more sensitive than tomatoes do. And what happens is the very stunted growth 
of the plant. And these pictures happened after very cold night. Uh, as I mentioned, cucumber are very sensitive to low temperatures. And if low temperatures happen, the most pronounced phenomenon you will see might be plant wilt. And one way to overcome the low temperature is through grafting. We have been doing research on grafting for a few years. What we observed is using grafting on cucumbers for the high tunnel production is that you could plant earlier and you could get higher yield, especially at the beginning of the season. This is a quote from one of the growers I worked with, with grafting cucumbers. He felt in his experience, and he said, uh, we are first market of cucumber by three weeks. It makes a difference sales-wise. It gets us ahead of the game quickly. It paid off very well. So the key of using a uh, cucumber grafting technique is to target for that early season. That is what we found, uh, we found in our uh, study. Okay, lastly, I will bring you back to this high tunnel cucumber production guide. In, and if you have more, um, um, if you want to get more information, as Laura and Dan mentioned, um, go to our cucumber production guide. Okay, that's the end of our presentation. I would appreciate you help us do a quick survey. <laughs> All right, here you see the sur survey here. We can post, you can answer those quickly. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, who I believe is Petrus Langenhoven, and he's going to be talking again on our high tunnel theme, but sweet pepper production. So um, I think if Petrus, if you can uh, share your screen, or I think Wenjing, you need to stop oh. sharing first. Let me finger the stop sharing. So I'm stop sharing it. Here, I, I can stop. Okay. There we go. There we go. Now, Petrus, you can start. Um, we'll just get a little bit of time. I think we've got most everyone with our questions. And once you get your stuff up, Petrus, we'll... Um, can you see, Philip? Yep, it looks good. Good, thank you. So yeah, I wanted to um, update you a little bit on the sweet paper high tunnel work that I'm doing at uh, the student farm in West Lafayette. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Here. All right, so uh, sweet peppers, to me at least, it's a, it's a very good summer crop. I think everybody loves to see a great quality sweet pepper um, uh, out there at the, the farmer's market. Um, there are some real advantages for um, smaller growers to, to tap into this, growing sweet peppers in high tunnels and uh, selling it at uh, um, farmer's markets or any other direct to consumer outlet. Um, there's a real benefit in growing sweet peppers in high tunnels. You can extend your season a little bit and also you protect your plant um, against um, adverse weather conditions during the summer. Uh, quality of the crop is good as well. Um, you can take it those extra few days and get it to color, uh, which usually is a, a pretty risky uh, effort out in the open field. So <clears throat> quite a profitable crop, um, especially when you take it to uh, full color. The reason why I started this project or well, this evaluation in uh, 2018 is really because I couldn't see a lot of information around Indiana in terms of uh, what grows well here and uh, what grows well in high tunnels. And um, so we started evaluating 10 varieties um, in the first year and we changed that uh, uh, every second year we take five out and put five new ones in. You will see as we uh, go through the information. Just a little bit more about how we grow it. So we, we grow on um, uh, four foot uh, center center bed spacing and one and a half uh, feet in, in the row. That brings you to about 7,260 plants to the acre. Although in this uh, tunnel, this 30 by 96 tunnel, we only include 300 plants 
um, inside the tunnel. We've used the uh, metal tea posts, eucalyptus stakes um, in the past, and I'm still not really very happy with the trellis system that I've got going. But initially, as you can see on the picture here uh, on the left, we uh, do a little bit of a Florida weave when the plants are little, and then we uh, just do a box support system around them. First iteration of this, I used uh, these uh, fruit tree lump spreaders to <laughs> uh, make a little box around the, the tea posts. And the following year, which was last, I experimented with uh, eucalyptus stakes that were five feet tall. Um, obviously, a lot more effort goes into to get these guys into the ground. And uh, I still wasn't very happy with the system since the, the plants were still lodging over. The papers are so heavy and so, uh, so many on, on the plants that uh, the plants are just uh, uh, leaning to one side and in the end they all uh, tend to uh, lie flat on the ground and that makes harvesting quite difficult. So I have to come up with another iteration that makes this um, more uh, production friendly. In terms of the, the soil analysis uh, where I have been doing um, these uh, paper evaluations and you can see um, we have pretty high pH in our soils. Um, compare that to some of our outside growing areas. Uh, it's more or less the same. So in general, we have a high pH issue on the farm, but we've amplified this issue inside the tunnels by adding a whole bunch of um, organic uh, material, compost. And uh, this is just a red flag for uh, you guys out there not to over um, compost um, your tunnels. Um, you get that huge spike in organic matter in your soil, but also there's a lot of uh, phosphorus um, that's being uh, uh, released into the soil. And obviously during the summer period when you have higher soil temperatures, nitrogen also gets uh, released and you can't really control that um, with this kind of a system. So we also generally had a very high calcium and magnesium um, content in the soil and a um, little bit out of balance um, and it's, it's really hard to, to rectify that. Also important to look at uh, your water quality um, when you irrigate, uh, especially if you use well water. We've been using uh, municipal water um, the first, during the first two years and last year I used well water again and uh, I could really see the effect on the plants and if you have uh, water with a high alkalinity content um, uh, and therefore high pH as well, you really need to think about investing in uh, um, a dosing unit that can inject some uh, acid into the system. If you don't want to use any sulfuric acid, you want to go something more organic, there's always citric acid um, available um, to do that as well. And it will really help to just get that um, pH down a little bit in the root zone um, around your, your plant. Coming back to uh, soil prep here, so what we do is we, we just till it with a, a BCS uh, rototiller, get a nice sign, uh, a fine seed uh, bed, not that we seeding directly into the ground, with a, um, a little harrow and then uh, on the planting bed itself I use a a broad fork just to, to uh, break the soil up to 12 inches deep and um, then it's ready to plant. In terms of uh, fertility, I've used uh, nature source uh, in the, the tunnels all these um, years I've been growing the peppers and we only in total apply about 60 uh, pounds nitrogen per acre um, at 300 ppm according to their uh, recommendations and um, the plant seems to be doing pretty well. And I use this because our fertility is already so high um, in, the, in the soil in the tunnel. I use this little injection unit, little dosatron. There are many other injectors um, available as well uh, to inject the fertilizer um, into the irrigation system. This is uh, what it looks like after we've planted. Um, you can use an, uh, a normal or very cheap, much cheaper drip line. I just uh, like to use these uh, individual uh, emitters. At the end of the season, I hang it up. You can see on this picture on the left here, um, 
the pipes are all hanging in the tunnel there and I reuse it the next season. It's not that uh, easy to reuse um, the, the cheaper uh, tea tape uh, kind of the appliance and so on. Looking at the varieties that we have evaluated, I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of uh, the varieties we used in 2018 and uh, 2019 and 2020 season. Um, these varieties, the five here at the top, um, those are the ones that uh, we uh, did two years of analysis on. So I tried to pick five varieties um, and go with them for two years. So we at least have two years data on each of them. The first year we just planted a whole bunch of bell peppers and one paper pepper. Um, um, but I didn't use these um, the four here at the bottom, Archimedes, Blitz and Tequila, Delirio. Uh, in the second year. I was mainly aiming to do uh, thick uh, wall or thick flesh type uh, peppers. And um, although the, the tequila was not that, it was a great pepper. It was um, uh, fantastic for frying, stir frying, uh, Asian style dishes and those kind of things. Uh, it's not that sweet as the other peppers are. And uh, the chefs on campus really like at uh, variety for their, their stir fries. Uh, this in information is also available in the Midwest uh, vegetable uh, trial reports. <coughs> we have a link to that a little bit later on. So in 2019, oh, the other thing I want to make attend, you attend to is uh, we actually seeded and planted quite late uh, in the first year. It was just due to logistical issues. Uh, we managed to get in earlier, like a month earlier into the ground in uh, 2019. Um, so I've included some paper papers here, Mercato, Carmen, um, Escamillo, which is uh, more or less the same uh, Cornito de Toro type uh, pepper, uh, Matadoras and uh, Jubilio. And for 2020, we changed the, the bell peppers again I added King Arthur, Goliath, Gold Rush, Flavor Burst, Socrates, and uh, Midas into the mix. So <clears throat> we uh, had a harvest period of about 35 days in 2018 due to that late uh, planting. In 2019, since we got earlier into the ground, we had about two months, 64 days uh, to get through harvesting, uh, and more is the same in 2020. And you can see the real advantage of having it inside a tunnel is you can, you can go into uh, mid-October depending on what the weather is like and uh, what the crop looks like um, at that time of year. In 2019, I felt like we probably could have gone another week maybe. Um, there were still um, sufficient papers on the plants to justify that, although you probably will not get papers to turn all the way red during that time of year and you will just harvest it mature green um, which still brings you um, some cash in the door. So <clears throat> this is what the tunnel will look like from a bird's eye view. You can see the roll-up windows on the sides here. Um, they are uh, helping with ventilation and uh, obviously these louvered vents in the, in the gable uh, as well. We have the landscape fabric in the pathways and uh, black layer at the bottom, white layer on the top. And that's really just to prevent weeds from growing. Um, no other reason why um, it is included there. Why I'm showing this picture is that we always have some kind of heat wave or extreme heat uh, period with the, within the production season. This was in 2019, um, the week of July uh, 14. And even though we have a double layer of uh, plastic film on the tunnel, uh, which already takes out about 40% of the light the ambient temperature was still um, about 2.3 uh, degrees Fahrenheit warmer uh, on the inside. In extreme conditions up to four degrees and that makes a huge difference uh, inside the tunnel. And depending on where your crop are during that time of the year, um, it might actually lead to um, um, blossoming, uh, blossoming drop um, or flower drop at that point. We don't really see sun skull in, inside the high tunnel. Um, that's mainly something that happens out in the open field. You maybe have a crop that doesn't have enough leaf coverage. And so the sun hits it directly and, and basically um, cooks that um, 
um, material there. Um, the blossom and drug is uh, quite familiar um, inside the tunnel, especially with the, the tapered papers, the longer papers. We don't really have time to go into the, the essence of uh, blossom and drug, which is a, um, a calcium induced um, disorder. Um, most of the time, and like you have seen in those soil analysis, we have ample calcium in the ground and uh, it's only a matter of the plants not being able to, to utilize it effectively during that time. But we can talk about blossom and drought um, at a later stage. Looking at uh, some of the yields that we've obtained, um, this is just the number of fruit per plant in the first column here in 2018, 2019, and on the other side of this uh, table, the number of fruit uh, per acre. Um, so 2018 was not a very good season, although we didn't get any, um, we didn't really get any uh, um, blossom and drought during that season it's because we probably bypassed it by planting a lot later. 2019, the, the crop was almost double um, and we got up to uh, 30 papers on the plant with, uh, with Chesapeake. Um, Flavor burst we've planted now for uh, three consecutive years in a row. Uh, 2019 was the best year. I think this is one of my favorite varieties. It's really uh, always producing. Uh, it's a very compact uh, plant, but the fruits are always there and it produces all season long. Um, so yeah, let's move on to the next one. Fruit size. Some of the guys like this Vanguard variety here produce uh, pretty large fruits. Um, others are around eight, seven, uh, and even six ounces. Um, um, and here, if you look at the uh, meters that we uh, tasted this, this past season, um, almost uh, 10, 10.3 ounces uh, on a fruit. Um, that's a pretty large fruit. Yields are pretty good, I mean, can't really complain about these yields uh, in a small um, in a small area. Um, in 2019, we got up to almost 3,000 pounds out of uh, a 30 by 96 tunnel, um, and this is with this uh, uh, sorry this this data here. Um, this past season it was a little bit lower; it was about uh, 2,700 pounds, um, but still um, a very good yield. Unmarketable yield, <clears throat> not really a lot of issues in uh, um, 2018 since we didn't really have any blossom and rot during that season. A little bit of uh, bacterial soft rot affected the fruit inside the tunnel, but not that much. Um, then again, we had some blossom and rot issues in 2019 um, and similarly in, uh, uh, in 2020. Some varieties are more affected than others. Um, this Goliath Gold Rush variety for some reason was really hard affected and you could see the, the specks even on the sides of the, um, the peppers. Flavor Burst, again, very trustworthy variety. Um, I had no uh, blossom and drought fruit um, in that sense. Midas, prone to get it a little bit more than the other bell peppers just because it's a, a much longer um, uh, bell pepper fruit. Looking at the, the tapered peppers, Matadores, Mercato, Jubilee, Escamillo, and Carmen. Carmen is almost like the, uh, the standard, I think. Everybody knows Carmen pretty well. Um, I, I started doing uh, Escamillo in uh, 2019. They're all very prolific. I mean, they produce huge numbers of uh, fruit uh, on a plant. Um, very good tasting fruit, great for uh, roasting and grilling and and frying this, um, these are really all uh, good varieties. Fruit size, see they're all around uh, uh, almost six uh, ounces, Escamillo, Carmen, uh, a little bit smaller. Um, yields go up to about 10 pounds per plant uh, for all these varieties. Um, so that's uh, pretty good. Now, looking at the blossom and drought, this is where um, the kicker comes in. And you can see some varieties are more prone to getting it. This Jubilio variety um, 
it's a super long fruit. Common uh, also almost had the same number in 2019, um, but it was still so prolific that you couldn't really see that um, it impacted uh, yield that much. But in a, in a good season, like you see last year, uh, we had a lot less of that, um, even uh, with the Jubilio uh, variety here. Uh, looking at uh, fruit length, uh, some of the dimensions, fruit length and width of uh, the bell peppers, um, you can easily see with these that some peppers like the Lirio here, it's totally a blocky pepper. Uh, some of them are a little bit more uh, elongated, um, like Archimedes. Um, so uh, Midas, as I said, uh, pretty much elongated, uh, even longer than Archimedes. So, very quickly, can you determine how uh, blocky or more elongated the fruits are? Interesting here is, um, as I said earlier, Jubilio, almost 10 inches long. Some of those fruits um, are up to 12 inches long. So it's a pretty long and big pepper, but it, it looks um, pretty nice. Here are some pictures of all the peppers I have uh, evaluated in the past. Um, Interesting again, tequila. Uh, this is the color uh, that the pepper starts with. And uh, so you can actually harvest it with this purple color or you can let it sit in the plant and it becomes red. Um, but I've noticed that the fruit quality does go down if you allow it to actually go all the way um, to red. So most popular is this deep purple or this uh, light purple color um, that it develops. Um, Vanguard, uh, very, very big pepper. One of the largest papers that we harvested was just over 18 ounces uh, for the one fruit. And um, so, yeah, it's also prone to, to produce uh, a couple of blossom and drug fruit. And uh, overall, it's just a, a very, very big pepper. And um, having a, an 18 ounce fruit is just uh, something that uh, people might not be interested in. Um, here is the flavor burst variety. Um, you can see it's a very nice fruit, not blocky at all. Um, very nice color as well. This is the Goliath gold rust that I was struggling with. And even here you can see little spots on the fruit there. That's just the beginning of uh, blossom and drought. Um, I included one of those so you can see how it compares to the other fruits. Um, I'm very excited about this Midas variety too, very prolific, um, great quality fruit, a uh, little bit more elongated. Um, but yeah, I can't say that any of these are actually uh, wrong picks, except for Goliath Gold Rush didn't deliver for us um, last season. Yeah, the tapered varieties, Mercato, common little bit shorter, it's Camille, you can see now that these two are related. Uh, Matadores and then Jubilio, which uh, are these uh, very long and flat uh, papers. They, they look gorgeous. They are uh, ready to be diced up and thrown into any uh, kind of dish. <clears throat> very little seeds inside too. And just another tip in terms of harvesting papers, it's either you can uh, put your finger right under this uh, pedestal here and flip it up um, and it will uh, separate here on the seam, um, or you can cut it. Cut obviously um, has some additional risks into it because you can actually cut into the fruit as you cut the, uh, the paper off. But uh, research uh, many, many years ago in uh, the Netherlands have shown that papers do last a lot longer post harvest if you actually harvest it um, like this. Okay, so yeah, some of the yields that we uh, got out of the tunnels, uh, pretty good, uh, depending on the variety. It was between two and 2,800 pounds uh, for the tunnel, um, if you extrapolate those uh, variety numbers um, in the 2020 season. Uh, Flavor Burst is probably one of my uh, absolute favorites and trust, most trustworthy peppers. But Vanguard, Chesapeake, Red Knight, and Zamboni also does well. Tequila, great pepper. They actually call it a patio pepper, so it's more aimed at the, the, the house gardens. Um, you can uh, plant it in the pot and get a good, good yield. It's early in the season. It produced for a very short amount of time. 
and it's out of the tunnel um, if you wanted to plant uh, a different crop. Um, King Arthur, Socrates, and Midas uh, shows quite a bit of potential since we only have planted them for the first time in uh, uh, 2020. Um, all the tapered pepper varieties are really good. Jubilio is the only one that if you're a little bit concerned about uh, blossom and drought, um, that one pr will produce more for you. Um, but it is a very attractive and long pepper uh, to throw into the mix at the, uh, the farmer's market. Um, Mercato also prone to getting blossom and drought, but less than Jubilio and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great pepper. So all these papers you see on the left here, that was from one picking uh, in the tunnel. So looking ahead at next year, um, we're going to rotate the old uh, um, taper papers out and put some new varieties in. Carmen will still be used as like an industry standard. We're going to include yellow crest, um, gathers, gold, sweet Italian, uh, Oranos, and uh, red sword um, in the coming season. I'm also thinking of changing the fertility up a little bit, uh, maybe using sustain. Um, A24, since um, this is a, a slow end release fertilizer, about 90% of that's being released over a 12 week uh, period. And for the organic growers, it is already listed. And we have used this on um, onions last year, and the onions performed incredibly well. And if we run into any nitrogen issues, I'm thinking of uh, using this in BioCure. Um, um, product that's derived from uh, chicken litter. Um, there is a, a caution on this that it, it, the nitrates are derived from sodium nitrate, so be careful using that uh, too much in the tunnel. Um, you might get a buildup of sodium in there since you don't get a lot of rain in it. Um, um, so it is already listed, but it's allowed with the restrictions because this product is highly soluble. So if you have a, a nitrogen deficiency and you want to boost your crop a little bit, um, this is an excellent product uh, to use. Um, we're also applying elemental sulfur. We did some in the fall already to get uh, the soil reaction going. Uh, but you has a nice publication uh, on loading soil pH uh, for the cultural crops that you, you can access um, through the Purdue Ed store. You can scan this link here. Um, and for those of you that are interested in uh, seeing more about the papers, we will have uh, our field day on July 29th at the student farm in West Lafayette. So keep your eyes out um, in terms of uh, any news coming forth, um, uh, any planning for this event. Uh, you can contact me or Laurie Joey Brown um, in that sense. Yeah, I would like to acknowledge the, the student farm manager, Chris Adair, and uh, the, the many students that they help us out there. Um, you can access these uh, uh, reports at, through the Midwest Variety Trial Report. Um, you can also access uh, production information through the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide. And here are my contact details. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have two quick questions um, right now. Um, while you're doing those questions, or the poll question. Um, one is, um, I think both related to nutrients on, in the high tunnel there. Do you have a check valve on your injection system there? Uh, check valve, back, the backflow. Backflow, yep. No, because, uh, no, I don't actually have one on there. Okay. And uh, the other one has a deal, you mentioned um, lowering the, P, the pH in, in the, um, in your irrigation water, would would uh, sulfuric acid work in that right. situation as well? No, well, sulfuric acid is an excellent product to use. Uh, it reduces the alkalinity very well. It is just a more dangerous product. And if you are interested in um, organic uh, production, then citric acid, um, which is not as dangerous, uh, also might be uh, an, an alternative. Okay. So there's a question about the small farm field day. Uh, yes, I am planning for the field day to be in person and we will follow that with a webinar series. All right, thanks for uh, filling out the poll, everyone. And I think we're gonna 
head it over. We're going to do our, our five minute break here. And uh, Lori will um, sh share some messages from our, our sponsors. Bay Horse Gold Pumpkin has quickly become a grower favorite. Farm markets love the dark orange fruit, its ideal ribbing, and sturdy handle. Commercial growers like the consistent fruit size and shape and yield, which helps them pack out their 40 count bins. Throw in powdery mildew tolerance that protects the crop and yield, and it's easy to see why growers have become Bay Horse fans. Visit rupseeds.com or call 800-700-1199 to learn more. There's nothing quite like fresh, sweet and buttery sweet corn. With over 100 varieties to select from, Rupp Seeds can help you grow perfect ears for your customers. If you need a cold soil tolerant variety to hit the early market, one that will stand up to shipping, or one with great flavor that will keep your customers wanting more, our team can help you put together a plan to produce great sweet corn all season long. Visit RuppSeeds.com or call 800-700-1199 to learn. For over 85 years, Norse Farms has produced and sold premium quality small fruit plants to national and international commercial fruit growers, home gardeners, and resellers. We're committed to providing customers with virus indexed, highly productive plants. This commitment drives us to stay on the cutting edge of the latest developments in the industry. We identify and test new varieties and growing techniques so that we can stand behind our promise to deliver quality to you. From our on-site lab to our greenhouse, our fields to our packing house, our number one priority is to ensure that you get the best plants possible. For more information about Norse Farms, visit us at norsefarms.com. Whether you're an experienced grower or first timer, we're here to help you every step of the way. We look forward to growing with you. My name is Brandon Lean, and I am the Deputy of Community Development Programs for Pathstone, Indiana. Pathstone builds family and individual self-sufficiency by strengthening farm worker, rural, and urban communities. Pathstone promotes social justice through programs and advocacy. Pathstone offers a great on-farm housing rehab program to help Indiana growers improve and maintain their on-farm housing. Indiana growers can receive up to $2,000 of matched funds for rehab projects. Indiana farmers, growers, and community groups seeking to substantially renovate or construct housing for farm workers are also eligible for technical assistance free of charge. You can contact me, Brandon Lean, at 765-286-2162 or B-L-I-E-N at pathstone.org. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, for sharing that sponsor break. I wanna introduce Laura Ingwell, who will be talking to us today about general pest management and protected environment. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Laura. 
Thank you, Lace. And we're going to start out actually with my poll questions. What can you guys see? Okay. So I've I'm going to talk to you today about pest management and controlled environments. So what I would like to know is what kind of a controlled environment do you have on your farm? Okay. Half of you don't have any. Um, Lace, help me out. So the next one I have is a, we're going to try to do a word cloud here, and I'm curious as to what your number one pest is. Um. I'm sharing the poll results that they gave, and I just now shared the link in the chat. You need to click that link to go to the word cloud and share your number one damaging pest. And then we're gonna share the results. Lace, can you see that? Do you still see my PowerPoint or do you see that window? I see your window that you have open, yes. So I see your the shared screen, yep. So once you people go there, they should see that live coming up. Okay. Lace, will you put one in just so I know it's working? <laughs> yes. Can you see mine? No. Yeah, I've also seen someone there's nothing. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll have to have... Oh, wait, there they are. Good, I good. I had to just refresh it. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Spotted squash bugs, mites, and thrips. Okay, um, if you haven't answered that, feel free to keep doing it. I'll check on it again in a little bit, um, but I can't even navigate. We're gonna get started here. So, I have too many screens. Okay, so why are we talking about controlled environments to begin with? Um, really what makes them unique, and that's the fact that they offer protection to our crops, right? And that's why we utilize them. And so that can include excluding rainfall, buffering temperatures, provide some level of a physical barrier to access the plants. And And if my slide switches, they also can protect our pests, right? So I think those of you that have grown in them or even are aware of them, there are a lot of pests that are commonly associated. And in fact, the number one um, that was in that word cloud is mites. So we think about these and oftentimes we call them greenhouse pests. So they are these soft bodied insects, aphids, mites, thrips, white flies. Um, the number one mortality factor in the field is rainfall. So when you protect that crop from rain, you're also protecting that insect pest that feeds on them. Um, but what we maybe don't expect in some of the very first research that came out um, that I was able to participate in here at Purdue in high tunnels in particular is that we sort of get this very unique hybrid of worst case scenario for greenhouse and field growing. And what we saw in, this, in these experiments was an aggregation of lepidopteran or caterpillar pests, um, finding their ways in the tunnels and then not being able to get out. So high numbers of egg laying and that turning into caterpillars damaging, more so than what we see in open fields. Um, so you really have to be prepared for a lot of different um, threats and what I am hopefully going to provide you with today is a, a bit of a set of tools or information to help you manage or mitigate those. And so I'm going to be talking about prevention um, that never gets old and it's always the number one tactic, um, monitoring some action thresholds and then biological and chemical controls. 
So prevention really is the key because once they get inside of these ideal protected environments on your crop, um, they can really wreak havoc and take advantage. So the best way to deal with insects is to keep them out. And so what that means is be cognizant of hitchhikers. Oftentimes you and or your employees can be the number one vector of moving insects um, from place to place or from the outside into your protected environment. Um, make sure that you're inspecting all transplants to make sure they're clean before you move them in and have an order of entry. Um, this can be in relation to maybe your most high value crop or um, once you do experience a pest outbreak or a, an infestation in an area, making sure that that is the very last place that you visit. Again, because you or your employees are the best vectors of moving them around. So making sure that you are isolating um, where that outbreak is happening. And another really important thing that I think sometimes we forget is this idea of minimizing reservoirs and secondary hosts. And so depending on your growing environment, this can look different. Um, if you're growing in soil in a high tunnel, this can be related to weed management. And so having really good weed management or using ground cover cloth to minimize these sort of secondary hosts can really help suppress pest issues. Um, if we're looking at controlled environments in um, say this picture here is inside of an old factory or in a greenhouse. Um, being cognizant of plant age and plant health and the location of those can be really important. So in this picture here, you're seeing that there are very young seedlings being grown right next to and below very old and almost neglected plants. And as plants get older, um, they oftentimes accumulate pests and pathogens. And so by having these two right next to each other, you're essentially um, spreading that around to new vegetation. So limiting plant age and segregating plants by age is, it can be really important. Um, so after all of the prevention that we can do, the next thing to do is monitor and be able to detect pests early. So knowing what could potentially be affecting your crop and what the early signs or symptoms of are an infestation are really helpful. Um, you want to make sure that you're scouting your plants early and often, at least on a weekly basis, depending on sort of the growth rate of the plant and the frequency of people moving in and out. Um, if they're growing quickly and you have a lot of um, migration in and out, then you should check more often. And when you're doing that scouting, make sure you're looking at both the top and the bottom of leaves because some of these pests prefer and are really good at hiding on the bottoms of leaves or in the whirl of the growing point. So knowing where to find them early in an infestation can help you um, detect it sooner. And again, looking at old and new growth, because depending on the pest, they may have a preference of so which part of the plant they're feeding on. And there's tools you can implement to help you with that. So things like yellow sticky cards, they can't manage a pest, but they can help um, with monitoring um, by intercepting them. So you know roughly presence or absence if they're in the environment or using something that does actually actively pull them in like a baited trap with a, a either a pheromone lure or a food source lure to try them pull to pull that insect into the trap first so you know when it's active in the environment and when you really need to be watching your crop. Um, then you have to understand the action threshold. And so what I mean here is what level of that pest is going to require me to do some action so that I don't lose the economic value of the crop. And that's going to vary depending on the crop and depending on the pest. But these are some general things to consider. Is that pest population increasing? Or is it sort of um, remaining at a stagnant level? So that can be flagging a particular part of a plant and coming back after time to see if that um, pest has moved. What part of the plant are they feeding on? If they're feeding on the leaves of the tomato fairly late in the year and they're, they don't feed on the fruit, then perhaps you can tolerate that pest. How big is the plant? Again, smaller plants are more vulnerable to losing um, vegetation. Larger plants, maybe you can handle losing some of that. And what is your intervention strategy? And this is important because it helps you understand how quickly you can expect to see a suppression in the population. So if you're using something like natural enemies or a bio 
biological pesticide, there's a time lag from the, from the point where you introduce that natural enemy or you apply that biological pesticide to the point when you would expect to see a reduction in that pest population. If you're using something like a knockdown insecticide, like a pyrethroid or some other synthetic insecticides, um, they have a fairly quick action on the pest. So you may see them fall off the plant as soon as you spray it or within 24 hours. Um, so that can impact sort of the level of pest um, that determines when you would intervene. And knowing if there is a healthy community of predators and maybe they have that insect pest under control. So um, being able to recognize predators and their contribution to pest suppression. Um, for instance, you'll see here, this is actually, um, I think in Petrus's um, pepper trial out at the student farm, they had an aphid infestation. But if you look closely at this leaf, um, Almost 70%, maybe even more of those aphids have been parasitized by a wasp. So all those gold aphids are already dying and on their way out. So in this situation, I wouldn't intervene because you have natural enemy suppression happening. And so you have to be able to recognize um, what that is on the leaf. And also here, surfid fly larvae oftentimes can be very cryptic, um, like little slugs in there munching on aphids. But if they're present, they can do the job. So sometimes you may not need to intervene. And again, here are some more natural enemies. So just becoming familiar with what natural enemies look like um, at different stages and what part of the pest they uh, are feeding on. So if you've determined that you don't have control and action is warranted, what are your options? Well, we're gonna talk about biological control and then pesticide applications, um, specifically biopesticides and synthetic pesticides, and a little bit about what are the considerations specific for controlled environments. Um, sorry, I have to check my time here. So here we have augmentation biocontrol. This is a strategy that has been shown to be very successful in greenhouses in particular. Again, that's because they are a fairly closed and controlled environment. And controlled, I mean, you have good um, temperature and humidity regulation. Um, and so augmentation means adding natural enemies into the environment. Um, and so the success of this in greenhouses has led to a thriving industry with a lot of commercially available natural enemies. Um, some of these natural enemies feed on pests and pollen and nectar, which can be an important source of protein and carbohydrates in their diet. Um, so having that diverse food source can help increase their establishment in an environment. And some of them have also been shown to be attracted to or respond to something that we call hip Vs in the jargony world, but it's basically a smell that the plant puts off in response to an herbivore feeding on it. So herbivore induced plant volatile. So they can actually smell the plants that are being fed upon by the prey items they like to eat. And you can buy these in commercial lures. Um, but if we transition away from greenhouse or um, sort of factory retrofitted controlled environments to these sort of hybrid high tunnel or caterpillar tunnel, we really need to think about dispersal because that is the number one factor that limits the implementation of biocontrol in field production in these open settings. So if there's not a lot of food around, those natural enemies are just gonna leave the environment or if the environment is not suitable. So this is the first thing that I looked at in my research program when examining um, high tunnel production in particular. How can we make this environment more suitable or more preferred by these natural enemies that we may release? So we compared um, conventional production where we did no intervening to one where we put this really fine screen mesh over all of the openings. And then lastly, we diversified that crop by incorporating some cut flowers, which you could also sell um, at the market in floral bouquets, but provides a food source. And then that commercially available lure that I mentioned that smells like a plant being chewed on by an insect pest. 
And so what we found here is that one of the natural enemies that we um, investigated responded really well to the, the flowers and that volatile lure. Um, and we saw increased retention of that natural enemy. And uh, contrary to that, we saw that actually the screening was quite detrimental to um, lace wings in particular here. And if we look beyond the natural enemies that we put in the tunnel and we look at those that naturally moved into the system, we see again here in this middle bar that that diversified tunnel with flowers um, and those volatile lures had increases of naturally occurring natural enemies. So enemies that are just in the environment actually moving into the high tunnel system. So we see great benefits for biological control um, in a diversified crop situation. And something else that we noticed, um, the, the focal crop here that we were growing was tomatoes and cucumbers. And what we noticed in relation to the way that we were pruning and trellising these on a single leader system with the intense pruning on the bottom and lowering, the stems was that we were actually removing a really important natural enemy in this in this system and that was lace wings so they preferentially lay their eggs on the bottom half of that plant and so by investing in these lace wings and putting them in the environment and then going back in a week later and pruning this vegetation off we're actually removing um, that beneficial organism so being aware of how maybe the cultural methods of growing may impact predator establishment is something we hadn't considered um, but returning to the screening here, um, we did notice some benefits from screening, so we did some further investigation of how can we optimize the screen size so that we can still exclude some pretty devastating insects, but not have those negative impacts on natural enemies and plant production um, due to increased heat. And so we were able to identify an optimal screen size here that kept cucumber beetles out of the system and eliminated bacterial wilt in our crops. Another system um, that helps promote beneficial insects is a banker plant system. And um, here we used this with a collaborating hemp producer. And so the idea here is that you put this food source out in the environment for natural enemies to feed on um, in addition to your crop. So what you see here are pots of oats that are harboring an aphid that only feeds on grasses. So the aphid, the pest cannot move onto hemp or many vegetables, only grasses. And then you inoculate that with parasitoids. So what you see here are two adult parasitoids and then um, all these other mummies here. So we are supporting this natural enemy population and if the pest gets into the greenhouse, those natural enemies are on hand and ready to move over into the cash crop. And with a little bit of training, um, my colleague, Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Long and I were able to teach the grower and the greenhouse manager how to implement this system. If you're not using natural enemies and you wanna use pesticides, um, there are some things to consider, specifically, especially in terms of controlled environments. So depending on the crop, and timing of outbreak, there are different things to think about. And that includes the restricted entry interval. So how long after application can a worker safely go back into that environment and work on that crop? And that can be related to harvesting or pruning or planting. Um, the pre-harvest interval, so this is in particular when you're getting close to harvesting that crop, how many days do you have to wait from application before it's safe for someone to consume that product? And then the personal protective equipment, and this is something in terms of making applications in high tunnels that can be um, pretty limiting in July and August, right? If you have to have a full body Tyvek suit with goggles and gloves and boots, um, there's a high likelihood that you'll overheat in that situation. Um, so you may not be able to get into that environment and safely make an application. And of course, the very last and maybe most important thing to consider is, is that product even approved for application in a controlled environment? And so um, there's a lot of different names and terminology and ways that we can categorize pesticides, biological, synthetic, organic, natural, Regardless of the type, they are all regulated by law. 
including home remedies. So if you like to mix Dawn dish soap and hot sauce and put it on your plants, that is an off-label application of pesticides. So when we're talking about food that people are consuming, we have very strict rules about what you can and cannot put on that plant and how that's monitored. Um, Biopesticides are something that show a lot of promise and can be implemented in controlled environments quite well because sometimes they have particular needs in terms of temperature and humidity to successfully um, work at pest suppression. So these can include biochemical pesticides, naturally occurring substances such as pyrethrin or neem as a directin, or microorganisms or microbial pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and fungi are some common formulations. The advantages of biopesticides is that they are inherently less toxic than conventional or synthetic pesticides. And so that is in terms of the applicator, as well as in terms of non-target organisms or beneficial uh, um, insects in the community. They affect only the target pests for the most case and closely related organisms, although you may find some exceptions there. Um, they're effective in small quantities and they break down quickly. So that's reducing these residues and off-target exposures. They can be incorporated with synthetic pesticides, but can reduce the use of them and also help manage resistance and conserve some active ingredients. But there are some things you need to know before you consider implementing a biopesticide. And that is that a lot of these or some of these are living organisms. So the time from which you put the product out till the time that it replicates in the host and kills that pest is much longer than what you would expect with a, um, a synthetic insecticide. So you have to be prepared again here for that window of control. So you may have to apply these at much lower thresholds when you maybe first detect a pest as compared to you when you would intervene um, with other types of pesticides. And you have to um, sort of familiarize yourself with how the, the product kills the insect and what to look for. So a lot of them disrupt molting. And so you'll see um, on this strawberry leaf here, these aphids that just didn't successfully molt. So you'll still see these like dead skins on the plant, but the insect isn't alive. Sometimes they're taken over by fungal bodies and they get hairy. Sometimes they liquefy because of a virus or a bacteria. So there's a lot of different things that you can look for. Um, and then I want to jump over to um, the online guide again and walk you through a few examples so that you know where to find the information specifically for controlled environments. And so here I'm at the midwestvegguide.org um, online. And for our first example here, we're going to choose a crop and we're going to go with tomatoes because tomatoes are commonly grown in controlled environments. and um, for this first pest here, I want to pick one that's a, a little bit tricky, and that is caterpillars, right? And in tomatoes in particular, I think about um, tomato fruit worm or the manduka caterpillar or striped army worm. But in the guide, we lump all the caterpillars together. And so we can go here and we'll see our results. And for this group of pests, we want to expand this information and here it's going to talk a little bit more about specifics. There are many different kinds and here are some examples and a warning to check the label because some products may be listed for a particular caterpillar but not all of them. And then if we scroll down here we'll see um, our options for control. Uh, BT is a very common and a really effective one and we lump all of the BT products together here, all of the different strains. So what you're looking at here are different strains. Um, in the application notes, we'll give you some examples of some um, specific formulations of BT or names of products that you could find. Here's that important information about restricted entries and pre-harvest intervals. And if we want to know about greenhouse use, we hit that show more button and right here we have greenhouse use and we find something like this, certain crops see label. So in this situation, you're going to have to go to the particular product that you want to use and look at that label to make sure that it's okay to use in greenhouses. Um, if we go down here to another product that's pretty commonly used, um, where's my radiant? We'll look here. Um, a one day pre-harvest interval isn't too bad, but if we go to show more, 
oh, right here it says greenhouse use, no. So I could not use this product in a greenhouse or a high tunnel or a caterpillar tunnel in the state of Indiana. If it is not allowed in greenhouses, you cannot use it in, in those controlled environments. Um, and another one I wanted to look at here is Warrior. Warrior has a bit longer of a harvest, pre-harvest interval. Um, this label is silent for use in greenhouses. So in the state of Indiana, you could use this um, in our high tunnel in our controlled environment production systems. So that's where you can find that information. Um, another pest, if we back up a little bit, um, of tomatoes is tomato spotted wilt virus. I hear about that a lot. So if we were to go look at the virus, first of all, um, and what we'll see here is that we learned that there's a, a few different viruses that can infect tomatoes, and these are carried by thrips. So if I wanna know how to control tomato spotted wilt virus, I have to go back to thrips and see how do I get rid of thrips in this crop. So I can go back here to my choose my pest and go to thrips. And this is where I'll find the information to, to get rid of that virus. So we'll hear, here we'll see information that, oh yes, this insect does transmit viral diseases. Here are some non-pesticide options. And then we go down here and we'll see some pesticide um, suggestions. Again, you have to open up more information from the pesticide to see if it's actually allowed in greenhouse use. And so in this instance, a sale is not allowed. So that's not one that I could use. Um, Azera is an organic and yes, it's a use allowed in greenhouses. So, so that's how you can get this information out of the guide in terms of um, products that you can use to control pests. Now, if you have a situation where you have natural enemies in the environment as well, but they're not quite getting the job, job done and you want to also try a, a pesticide product, there are um, side effects databases available from some of the big um, biological control manufacturers manufacturers of these um, beneficial insects. So you can go in here and you can choose the beneficials that you're seeing in your environment and a few different chemistries and look at the risk of if you apply this chemistry, will it have a positive or will it have a negative impact on that insect or is it pretty benign and, and it will keep my natural enemies intact. So that's a really important thing I wanted to just briefly make you aware of. Um, and then the very last things and things that I think we often overlook just in the haste of the season is you really need to keep good records and rotate your products. And this is for two things. One is to manage for resistance. A lot of these small soft bodied insects can develop resistance very quickly, including to some of the organic pesticides or the biologicals. So you really need to keep records and make sure that you're rotating products um, within a growing season and then evaluate them. Be sure to evaluate the effectiveness. How long did predators stick around? How quickly did you see a reduction in pests? How long did that application offer protection before I saw that pest to rebound and increase? And is it controlling every stage of the insect? This can really help you make better choices and reflect on and, and increase the efficacy of your um, management plan in future. And so with that, um, you can find a lot of this information and resources on the Extension Veg website, or you can reach out to me directly. And I don't know if I have time for questions. You do have time, a few minutes for questions, actually, Laura. And it looks like someone asked, Melanie asked, are the phenologies developed for our key pests to time applications? I'm not sure if I understand the question, Melanie. Um, I could answer it, I guess, by saying that, um, so it depends on the product you're using in terms of what stage of the insect that's controlling. And so that also product can also be towards natural enemies. So some natural enemies will feed only on the egg stage or only on the larval stage. Um, 
or only on adults, and some of them can feed across all of those. So really understanding that compatibility in terms of what stage the pest is being suppressed at um, can impact that. And the other thing I, I think in, you know, in a situation with like squash bugs, we do know that in the climate where we are, it takes about 10 days for eggs to hatch. So in that case, the phenology of understanding when you first see those eggs, when to make an application, you want to wait 10 days. Um, but knowing that in general, warmer environments speed that up. So if you're in a high tunnel or a really warm greenhouse, that development happens more quickly. And so you may need to reapply more often if you're only hitting a specific life stage. Thank you. And it looks like I know that Jeff Burbrink had asked about growing flowers with tomatoes and Dan Eagle did kind of answer. Go ahead. And no, so that's in particular with thrips, it is not a good idea to grow bedding plants and vegetables together. Almost every incidence of tomato spotted wilt virus that we've seen, and Dan has gone with me to um, some last year, is because there was cut or flower bedding plant, flower production in the same greenhouse as vegetable production. So that can really depend on, on the, that pest complex in particular. Um, yeah. I guess that's all I'll say. We didn't see, we don't have thrips very often in general where I do the research at Mix Farm. And so in that work where we were incorporating flowers with cucumbers and tomatoes, we did not see any of those negative effects, but thrips are pretty non-existent. Laura? Yes, Dan? Um, what I, I tried to write in the, in the chat box is that I think if one were to grow their own flowers, and, and put those in the greenhouse, that would be, that would lessen the chance of getting thrip problems and therefore tomato spotted wilt. That's right, because it does usually come from really large production where you're buying transplants. And we started ours from seed in my work as well. Melanie asks, it was said that there is a lag pest deterrent activity, thus being able to know when a pest will soon emerge and you can get a product in on time or on in time. Okay, yeah, so for some pests, we have that information um, really well established. So with some of the orchard pests in particular, like coddling moths or oriental fruit moth, or even with the seed corn maggot, which I'm going to talk about next week, um, we, we have a very good understanding of temperature in relation to development. And so we can monitor in the spring, what we call growing degree days or development degree days, and be able to predict when these insects will emerge so that you can time applications. So that's another tool that sort of complements that idea of um, monitoring with sticky cards or baited traps to be able to detect. Um, but that's not, it's very effective for a few insects, but it's not like a widespread for, for every insect, so. Thank you. That's all the questions we have. I'm sure if people have more questions, are you going to stick around, Laura, and you can answer them in the chat? Yes. Thank you so much. So now we're going to have um, Dr. Ariana Torres has an awesome uh, website. Right now it's under construction. It's called the Hoosier Food Market website. So it's under construction right now, but we're going to watch a video about that. Thank you. Um, so if you can stop the video a little bit, Beatrice. Yeah, so um, I guess something that I want to say and explain a little bit further is I want to take a few seconds. I know we have a very, very tight schedule with amazing presentations, but um, so this website was uh, built on an, on, a, on an open source and we're right now trying to transition in. We are transitioning to a more local um more local websites. So we have been in conversations with Indiana Grown and other organizations to see if we can uh, transition this website to be in Indiana run by an organization in Indiana. So what is going on is the website, how it is now, it's going to be similar as we finally put it into a new server. Um, 
but the same we're gonna have the same characteristics and the same things and um, as soon as we have that uh, agreement, we're going to create new videos that are going to be um, updated with the new characteristics, but it's going to be very similar. So that's why um, I wanted to play this video. So yes, you can play it now. And it's going to be awkward to, to watch myself. Coming in and watching this video, um, today where I'm going to talk about the Hoosier Fruit Market. This is a website that we've been working uh, with other researchers from Purdue University, as well as with Microsoft. and um, there are two parts of this presentation. The first part where I'm gonna talk about what is Hushu Food Market. I'm gonna give a brief introduction. And for the second part, I'm gonna uh, add a video that was part of an um, interview with a farmer. It was a Q&A with a farmer where I was talking and guiding that farmer through the idea of um, starting an account, selling products, creating shipping methods, and also charging customers. So. You're going to see first a presentation and then I'm going to lead you into a video right after. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to, we're going to uh, get that, that presentation going. This is a Hoosier food market um, and you guys are already seeing my name is Ariana Torres. I'm a I'm a marketing specialist, assistant professor at Purdue University. I also have uh, this extension program called Horticulture Business. And um, as I said before, Horsher Food Market is, uh, online, is an online platform to sell fruits and vegetables, but also bread, honey, milk. Um, kind of like think about like an online farmer's market directly to customers. And this is part of a collaboration between Purdue College of Ag and Microsoft. So basically, Hoosier Food Market is powered through um, Open Food Network, and Open Food Network is a global network of people and organizations that has an open source platform to help um, make food systems more resilient. Uh, so what is Hoosier Food Market? Uh, HoosierFoodMarket.com is a software that makes easier to manage orders and stock to sell online it also can help you to create reports about what things you sold and how to do packing. Also allows you to have a transparent supply chain where customers can directly know where are their farmers and know all the products and those transactions are very um, transparent with a very transparent payment management and farmers and consumers can filter products by type and other food qualities. Uh, uh, Hoosier Food Market can be managed by producers, CSAs, uh, makers, and artisans, but also hubs, food hubs, stores, co-ops, and buying clubs can manage it. And these are different uh, things that these businesses can do or these different modalities. And then, of course, it can be also um, be managed by farmers markets. Things you want to consider is that um, you have... Uh, you need to know where's your farmer's market. If your farmer's market has a website, this is not a substitute of a website. This is another channel. Think about it's another farmer's market that you're going to sell. It's just online. You need to know what products, the variety and the diversity that you have. You still need to keep weekly communication with consumers because just because you have a website, that doesn't mean that consumers are just going to come. They need to know what are you selling and if you, if possible, just have a short newsletter, email, sign up list, etc. cetera. Uh, you need to know what are your safe payment, pay, safe payment methods. So credit cash, credit card, cash or delivery or subscription services. And especially during COVID have these safe delivery methods and costs. This is what a single producer um, online shop kind of looks like where here we have the name of the farm, here we have the order cycle and the order cycle is, for example, think about you're going to, um, you're going to a farmer's market every Saturday and your order cycle is from Sunday to Friday night because that's when people can order. What is the timeline that you're willing to start taking orders and what is the timeline that you are willing to stop making, taking orders? And that is your order cycle. And now we're going to go through the video with a video later on, um, how to create those orders and why are they important? Then you see the products, you see the farmer and consumers this is what they see. They can order one uh, package of African peanut soup 
it's a vegan meal kit, those, that information, you all put it on Whole Share Food Market. How do you use it? You register your enterprise, you gotta list your products. Uh, if you're part of food hubs, farmers markets, co-op stores that have a store in Hoosier Food Market, you can connect them and you can allow them to have access to the list of products that therefore they can sell for you or not, depending on what you want. Why do you want to use uh, all of them? So, uh, sorry, Hoosier Food Market. So Open Food Network is a bigger platform that Hoosier Food Market is used for Indiana farmers. Uh, let's say you just want to be visible. You want to be in the map and you're going to see in the video the map of, of Hoosier Food Market. You may want to supply and sell products um, through the Hoosier Food Market. You want to sell on products or you want to sell others. So anyway, any modality actually works. So if you want to create your account, you're going to go to www.hoosierfoodmarket.com and log in. And you log in. If you need to sign up, you go to this screen, you sign up. And then you'll receive an email that is going to confirm that your email address and then you start logging in. And right after, if this is the first time you're logging in, you need to create your profile. Either you're a producer who sells or producer who doesn't sell, just visible. If you're going to sell, you're going to, you're going to be able to list products, charge people, create or recycles, generate reports. As a producer, you can sell or not sell. And, or you can be a food hub or farmer's market. And this is the things that you need to do. Uh, you need to register. Uh, here's an example of a business that I created. It's called Ford Business Test. And you need to put your address. And why the address is important? Because it tells your customers that you are a business, a farmer who exists. It gives transparency. And transparency is really important in these days for any local food system. Uh, you're going to put your primary uh, contact, your email address, your phone number, and just going to click continue. So you can be a producer or a food hub. If you're a producer, you are growing things, uh, you are making things, you are creating things. If you're not a producer, you're just reselling. You're like a store. And um, you, ideally, you would put a description. Who are you? What is your legal business name? Are you going to charge sales tax? For example, in this case, I said no, because I'm an education uh, program. But if you're going to charge sales tax, then you click yes. And that's going to generate automatically a sales tax when you um, sell to people. You will have to uh, in, uh, upload your logo. And ideally, you do have a logo. Um, in a lot of the social media training that I do, we do uh, suggest farmers to create their logo and you can go to Google to Google and, and look for uh, a good logo generator and just create your own logo. I think it's good to be simple, but also tells your customers that you have a brand. And you can create a banner. Think about their logo is your um, profile photo and your banner is their background photo that is in the back. And you're gonna see how it looks like. You want to talk about, you want to connect all your social media accounts. So your website, your Facebook account, um, your Twitter, all those things. And um, if you want more information, there's a website for Open Food Network. Uh, that's my, my email address. Um, and next, you guys are going to see the video of how do you manage live a, a Hoosier Food Market uh, website. Thank you. So one of the things that you need to do is when you see this little guy here, there is uh -huh. the, this administration account and logout. Me as Ariana Torres, I can also purchase. And it's telling me shopping at producing farm because that's a website that I entered last. And it tells me a shopping cart. So even though I'm a farmer, I'm listed as a farmer because I have the hard business test. I can also purchase, which I have. I've purchased from the Purdue student farm. I've made purchases of their basket. So if you okay. see this little guy here, there's an administration. You want to click there. And that's where everything happens. This is your settings um, page. So one of the things that you want to see is where, where are you? And it's going to tell you where is Purdue uh, Hort Business Farmers Market. And I am here, Hort Business Test. 
Again, I, you, I put different categories of things that I sell, vegetables, bakery, household, and fruit. This is just for testing. I only right. have a pickup and delivery option and I have my social media here, my email, et cetera, but I'm not selling anything. You know that. <laughs> so right. that's right. just to, that's just to see how it looks like. But when you're at, when you're starting a, a, and let's say I'm going to start an account. You have to have this icon that says has a shop front. So one of the things that in open food market, you can be just a from profile, meaning that you are not going to be able to sell anything. You just, you're listed on the map, but you don't sell. You need to set uh, yourself as a farmer who sells has a shop front and there is an, there is, <coughs> a, there is an option. And I'm going to create that video. I'm going to start from creating a profile to creating a shop front. Uh, and I'm going to send that on, and I'm going to post it on my social media so people can access it. And that's going to happen okay. within a week. That's my plan. Um, so one of the things that I can change my package. So you see, you can be, when you create your profile, you can be just a producer profile. You can be a producer shop, or you can be a producer food hub, which is Plymouth farmer's market. I'm sure you clicked here. That's, because that's what I did with the farmer's market one. Yes, I clicked there. Mm -hmm, exactly. So the producer profile, it just allows you to be there, but you're not going to be able to sell. A producer shop sells. And a food hub sells from yourself and from others. You're an aggregator. So and I want to be a producer shop. shop. So you're always going to have, when you start, you're going to have the change package and the producer shop, shop is the one that you want to select, if that makes sense. Uh, that would be for Busy Bee Ranch, and that's what we picked for that. Exactly. Right? For a okay. farmer's market, go to producer hub. For a farm who wants to sell online, producer shop. And for a farm who just wants to be on the map, it's a producer profile. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Okay, great. And then well, the first thing that you want to add is um, I would add profile details. So remember I told you about your social media. Of course, you want to have your name, if you're a producer, and if you want to be visible. So sometimes you're saying, you know what, I'm not going to farm for three months, especially smaller farmers. So I don't want to be visible. I don't want people to contact me. But if you want to sell or be there, um, this is your permalink. It's basically if people are going to say hosherfoodmarket.com slash for business test. That's the link, but don't pay much attention. And that's my link. Uh, you want to add your address. It's very important for consumers to know that there is an address. Your contact information is also very important. And then in social. For your social, for Facebook, you have to have your Facebook e uh, URL. So www.facebook.com slash Plymouth Farmers Market or BCB Farm, whatever Facebook profile you have. But you want to add the whole HTTPS uh, two points, slash, slash, blah, 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 blah. For your social media, for Instagram, you just add the username. Because if you go to, uh, let's say, Twitter, if you go to my Twitter, which I'm going to try to go now, my username is at Hort Business Purdue, at Hort Biz Purdue. So you want to just add your username. Same for link for LinkedIn. It's again your uh, website, www, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you say that in the about you is where you describe your mission. Ideally, you will have your mission there. Business details, if you are charging taxes, you want to add your tax ID. Uh, and I'm not charging sales tax, but if you do want to charge sales tax, depending on your state, you have to set up that uh, sales tax. If you want to add an invoice, so let's say, Hort Biz, thank you for shopping, for shopping at Hort Biz. If you want to add a personalization for your invoice, you can add those names, but um, it's really not that important. Uh, okay. And then your your images. And this is very important. Remember the other farmer who had a very distorted photo? 
right. it's because the logo has to be 100 by 100 pixels. And that's something that you can add in your computer. You just say, if you can Google how to convert photos to certain images, you can modify photos by certain pixelation, ideally. And then this is your profile photo, but then this is going to be your promo, which is the background. So you can have a logo, kind of like your profile photo, and then a background. And this is the one I chose. And it has a different size because it's bigger, 1200 by 260. And you can choose remove images as much as you want. Then you want to go to properties. I don't want to save. Nothing really to do with properties unless you manage three farms. But right now I just have mine. The shipping methods. Uh, the shipping methods is, it's very important because that'll tell your customers how can they purchase from you. So I'm asking, so I can manage my shipping method and say, I want to deliver a weekly basket by me. And it's in North America and there's a flat rate, both checkout and back office. So why is this important for you being Plymouth? Because let's say you're selling for BCB, but only through the Plymouth farmer's market. So you're going to create a shipping method that says name pickup at Plymouth farmer's market. Oops. And what you want to do is say, please collect, please come to the booth between, I don't know, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. So let's say. And you want to say pick up. Mm -hmm. And if you want to charge a flat fee, you can add it here or you can say no. But what it is important is to also say who manages. If I want to have, if I am BCB, if this is my BCB profile and I want to deliver at the Plymouth Farmers Market, I can ask Plymouth to to be manager of this as well. Does that make sense? So yeah, yeah. if you're in gonna- In other words, they could come drop it off to, at the market and we could disperse it from there. Yeah, and for you, it's really not a big deal because you're the farmer and you're the farmer's market manager. But let's say John is, it's a farmer who doesn't have access to internet and he's not interested. John can list you as the, their food hub. And therefore, you're going to be able to manage these orders and understand who needs to come. It gives you access to their orders information. And you can collect the money, whatever you guys decide to arrange that. But in this case, okay. I only have hard business tests because I'm not under an, any hub. But if I am right. under some hub, which is a profile setup, I will have to put, um, I have to put manage. Right. And I can say, uh -huh. okay, I'm going to put Plymouth here, but I'm not going to, because I don't have any. Right. So I created that shipping method and you can see here, I'm saying, Hey, I'm going to pick up of the Plymouth and distributor should, I should say Plymouth farmer's market, but I don't have you listed as my hub and I'm going to charge per pound. You can always come back and edit or delete whatever you want to do. Oh, okay. So it's very custom. Uh, you can customize it as you want. So let me go and see dashboard. Let me go back again here. Payment methods is also very important. So you would like to tell them, um, manage payment method. I have cash and MasterCard, but let's say you want to take PayPal or you want to collect and collect the money at delivery. Those are things that you can add, put it there. People can also pay you with MasterCard. And for that, you will have to log in your information as a charger. So I'm going to go through, you change the name, you tell your description, you say only at checkout. So people can only pay at checkout or they can do before, or they can do either. Back uh, office is before, right? Yes, it's before. That's so let's I say I, I want you, I want someone to pay for their basket on Monday and they come up, pick, they come pick it up on Friday. You tell them that option. 
Okay. You want to say active, if you want to tag, and then the provider. You can do PayPal, pain payments, cash, and MasterCard. I don't have a MasterCard um, payment method rated, but you can, if you have, I think cash is probably the most um, useful one. And then if you want to change a rate, a percentage that is flat, uh, per, uh, a dollar number, flexible per item, price act, whatever you decide, and you create it. So you go back and say that. So let me go back to dashboard. That's a payment method. If you're charging fees, I don't charge fees, but uh, you can create enterprise fees, especially if, if you're a Plymouth Farmers Market and you want to charge your, your producers, you can create one. The inventory settings is very important because, I mean, if you want to check your inventory, but let's say this week I'm going to start selling potatoes. I want to be potatoes on the top of my list. Okay. Uh, so new new products can be put on my into my sh uh, shop front. Uh, but if you actually select the other option, you have to add it manually. So I want that every time I set up a new product, it comes automatically on the top of my inventory list versus no, I need to add it to my inventory. No, sorry, my dog. <laughs> I'm surprised mine aren't up here in my lap, so. No. Yeah. So let me go back to dashboard. And here's, there are two things that are very important here. So the first one is manage products. So you, if you're interested, if you're a farmer who wants to tell your customers, hey, I'm going to have these for sale, you want to add your products. If you're a farmer who wants to have order cycles and close orders at a certain date, you want to have order cycles. If not, you just create your order cycle of a year. That means that for a year, the next year, you can get orders anytime and at any point. But if you are, as I know some farmers like to close at some point orders, then you can add an order cycle of a week, two week, a month. I think I did for a year, to be honest. So here are my products. So this is the products that I have. Uh, let me delete these. I have nothing here. Okay, so let's create a product. So I'm going to create a new product and it comes here and the supplier, I can have any supplier. So if you're Plymouth Farmers Market and you want to list the products of an, of an Amish farmer, you can select that farmer from the list because you are, you have the right of their, of being their food hub but I just okay. have my farm. So her business is a supplier. And let's say I want to do, I want to do, uh, this, this is grams. I want to do pints. So I want to sell pints of blackberries. So I select an item because there's no pint unit. So I just say item. And then I want to click on product category. So it's a fruit because that's gonna tell people what am I selling? Remember when I clicked on the name of my name, I sell bakery, household products, right. fruits and vegetables. This is the way you tell them what do you sell. And then product name is gonna be blackberries, blackberries. Mm. And then let's say I'm gonna have, I'm gonna sell them by the pint. So one pint uh -huh. and the price is gonna be, let's say 350, right? And uh -huh. then you're going to tell them, you want to tell them how many I have. I'm going to have 50 in my order cycle. Okay. I want to tell them that the, the shipping category, and I want to ask them for a file. Oof, I don't have, the idea is that you're always going to have, so let me go to download a Blackberry pint, a photo. You, you always, ideally, you always want to have a photo. Yeah because that tells people, um, yes, I have that. So Blackberry, okay. So I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna add the photo, which is on my desktop somewhere. <laughs> I don't have it. Where did I save it? Uh, let me see, Blackberry, save image as, oh, I know what I did. I'm gonna put it here. 
So I'm going to come and choose a file and it's a Blackberry. Here it is. And then uh, let's say you say um, purchase, you can add a description, purchase the best blackberries in Northern Indiana. Uh, they are organic. They are biodynamically grown. I don't even know what that means, but people use it biodynamically Dyna grown. Um, and then you can again select the producer, right, sorry, and then create. And here's my product. There are blackberries and I have 50. I think that's the end of the video. Um, there is, you can stop the video. <laughs> there is uh, 20, more 20 more minutes that were cut just for the sake of this webinar and keeping everything on chat. But um, I shared the full website on my on the chat so you can access that and any information when Hoosier Market will be live again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ariana. I want to let everyone know, remember that if you want CCH credits, put your name in the chat box so you get credit. Also, I want to tell you what next week's topics are. Next week, we're going to be talking about monitoring and managing seed corn, maggots, and related crops, caterpillars and other insect pests on coal and kale crops, indoor and field production of specialty melons, potassium for vegetable production, and food safety for fresh produce update. And also, I wanted to thank all of our speakers today, uh, Wenjing Wan, uh, Laura Ingwell and Dan Eagle, Petrus Langoven, Lori Jolly Brown with the sponsors, Laura Ingwell and Ariana Torres. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much everyone for being here. Take care.